This isn't your grandma's cancer show. Not your grandma's cancer show. Hi, I'm Tatum Durock, and today we're talking to Dominic Walker. He's a filmmaker and storyteller, and he was diagnosed with incurable brain cancer at 27. He's created a stunning audio essay and did that as a way to collect his thoughts, express how he feels and share that with other people. So afterwards, we're going to be chatting with him further about the creative process, but I really want you to hear his essay. The story was meant to end on the 20th of November. This was the date of my consultation with the neurosurgeon who had two weeks before removed a golf ball sized tumour from my brain. This was the date when it would be confirmed they'd removed a benign tumour or, in his words, low grade glioma. I told the surgeon I'd recovered well since the operation. I'd had some headaches and gastric problems but nothing significant. I was ready to get discharged and get on with my life. I thought I might read a book about brain tumours, learning more about the most memorable health scare in all my 27 years. It would be a story I'd tell when I was an old man. But then the surgeon paused and adjusted his gaze. He said, it's difficult news, I'm afraid. You have a grade 4 tumour called a glioblastoma. It's highly malignant. I didn't immediately know this meant cancer, thinking malignant was synonymous with serious or bad. The word cancer was never used, in fact. But when I was told I'd be seeing an oncologist the following week and be due to start radiotherapy, I knew I wasn't done with this yet. I would have thought getting diagnosed with brain cancer would involve a sinking feeling, panic, sweats, perhaps tears, but it was just pure incomprehension. I didn't know the implications or consequences as I sat on my sofa on a video call with the doctor that Friday afternoon. I wanted to hear some statistics. He told me the average survival rate after diagnosis is about 18 to 24 months, but he stressed that this was an average. I was about 40 years younger than the average age for a diagnosis of this kind, so perhaps I'd be different. In the weeks that followed, cancer was the first thing that crawled into my mind when I woke up. For 10 minutes each morning, I'd stare into the walls of my room and contemplate that I had a deadly illness, something that would probably kill me. Other times, death wasn't so explicit. The word cancer would drift into my consciousness and that I'd go and have breakfast. So I thought the story would end in November, but where did it begin? That is equally imbued with uncertainty. Did it begin 10 years ago when I inexplicably began to feel extreme fatigue, a long-standing tiredness that has stayed with me all these years, or when I started to experience aches and pains with no obvious cause? When you discover you have something wrong with your brain, it's tempting to attribute past ailments and disturbances to the quantitative images on an MRI scanner, the hard evidence that something is wrong, mortality mapped onto a graph, Intuitively, I felt that something was wrong in my head for years, but I never suspected a tumour. After research and conversations with doctors, I'm not convinced I can put it all down to a tumour. It's entirely possible that I had a benign lump growing, festering, in my skull for years, perhaps ten, perhaps longer. And then quite quickly, within a few months, it advanced into an aggressively malignant tumour. The notorious glioblastoma that kills 95% of patients within the first five years of diagnosis. If we want a proper start, an uncontroversial beginning to the story, we have to go to August 2020. This is when I wake up in hospital, disorientated, in agony. I can barely move. My mum is by my side. Okay, so can you talk a little bit about what happened in the summer when you had those seizures? Uh, so yeah, on the 10th of August, 2020, I had three, two or three very long seizures. How long? 20 minutes or more. Um, um, but what, only two, two of them were witnessed, but the other one I possibly had. Where were you? Uh, I was upstairs uh, in my bedroom and apparently I was on my, I was on the phone to Finn and... 
apparently I wasn't making any sense. We we talked talked about this at a later point. He was asking me loads of he was asking me some questions and I just wasn't re- replying to them and I wasn't making any sense and he just said okay this conversation is going nowhere and just hung up uh, and then uh, I think maybe twenty Did minutes you, think you were just taking the piss I don't he didn't know what to think um, but then but twenty minutes later I think I came downstairs or however long it was came downstairs and apparently I was just this according to my mum just saying back 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 and holding my back and then had a severe seizure for about 20 minutes and my parents were kind of like I right, called the ambulance the ambulance arrived um i think i'd, I'd finish the seizure had finished by this point a paramedic asked me what my mum's name was which i got wrong i got my age wrong they were going to take me into hospital so i went upstairs to pack some clothes none of this i remember by the way then i went into the bathroom where i had another seizure also lasting about 20 minutes. And got stuck, jammed in the bathroom between the door and the toilet. Uh, And then they had to call a second ambulance. So they had to have four paramedics to kind of lift me out into into the ambulance. And then they just gave me some sort of diazepam or something uh, intravenously. And then I woke up in hospital with a very, very bad back backache <laughs> yeah woke up in hospital uh in a lot of pain and i fractured my spine so you predicted you were gonna hurt your spine before you had your seizure back back well this is the this is the thing i mean this is why it's thought that i had one i, I might have had three seizures two i had two seizures that were witnessed by other people that because i had hurt my back uh, and i was saying back 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 um my mum thinks that i had a, a, a first one uh, or an, an initial one. And you I, got no memory of any of No this. memory of any of any of it. Um, and then I remember just waking up in hospital feeling very, like, disorientated. My mum was there. And, um, yeah, oh, in a lot of pain because of this uh, spinal fracture. Um, and then I think I'd already had a CT scan by this point and still kind of, like, unconscious. By the time I wake up, I'm told they found a shadow on my brain. They think it's a tumour. I spend an unusual night in hospital. The man opposite me has overdosed on paracetamol. He tells me he's also coming down off heroin. When evening comes, I pull the curtain closed and try to rest. But there's another man, Barry, who keeps coming into my cubicle, speaking nonsense. The man opposite says, No, Barry, leave Dominic alone. This happens several times throughout the night. I suspect Barry has dementia or a kind of mental affliction. Before I leave the next day, the man who's overdosed, who might be on his way to London for an organ transplant, asks me if I can lend him money for drugs. I lie and say I have none. What a night. On my discharge letter, I read the words, likely low-grade glioma. The follow-up plan is, is that I'll be referred to Dereford Neurosurgery Department in Plymouth. On a concoction of anticonvulsant drugs and steroids, I return home with chronic hiccups and a sense of deflation. Part of me is glad a problem has been found and that the problem will be removed by experts with sharp tools. Part of me is traumatised by what's happened and I just want to forget about it. But my back does not let me forget. Every day I wake up at 5am in ricocheting pain. I go downstairs and drink morphine from the fridge and try to get back to sleep. Every day is filled with suffering. And uncertainty as I wait anxiously for someone from the neurosurgery department to call and tell me what their plan is. But I get silence for two weeks or more. Eventually a nurse with a warm voice rings and asks how I've been. I say nothing of my dismay that I felt I'd been forgotten about. Like the letter, she says, low-grade glioma. It's comforting to think I have something benign. I'm told that I'll have surgery sometime in the next couple of months. Soon, I have an appointment with the neurosurgeon, a video call, just like the one I'll have two months later when I find out the results for the biopsy. He tells me I have a tumour 2.5 by 2.5 centimetres in my frontal lobe. It needs to be removed. The treatment goals are twofold. To reduce the risk of future seizures 
and to perform a histology test to find out exactly what it is I have in my skull. The tumour is not far from the area of my brain that controls speech and language, as well as left-handed movement. Being a lefty, no one fails to see the importance. To be extra cautious, the operation will be done while I'm awake, in order for him, alongside a neuropsychologist, to perform tests and preserve these essential functions. In the days before the surgery, I have nightmare visions of the surgery going wrong. The chance of a stroke is between 10 and 20%. Not insignificant. What was your first reaction to thinking about having brain surgery? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty daunting to think about having brain surgery. Um, but I thought, you know, better out than in. And... <laughs> <laughs> Is that the slogan for Brain Surgery UK? Yeah, when you walk, when you go through the door into the operating theatre, that's just above the door. Big sign, better out than in. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, yeah, I was, I was like, uh, I knew that it was, I knew that it had to be done and I wanted it to happen as soon as possible. How were you feeling just before it was coming? Yeah, I felt fine. I felt fine about the surgery. Um, generally I was very kind of impatient at this point for it to just be over with. It was quite similar to doing my final exams at university. Where I was were just, you still on the meds at that point? As well? Yeah, still on the meds. I had to go in for a COVID test a couple of days before and. I remember going down to the beach for a walk and thinking, you know, you have these thoughts in your mind, like maybe this is the last time that I'll ever walk if something were to go wrong. There's, you get those kind of ang anxious thoughts propelling around your head. It seems like the 5th of November will never arrive. It's interminable, this waiting. Eventually it does. I'm surprised to wake up. I actually got some sleep. My mum and I drive down to Plymouth in the dark morning. It's 6.30 a.m. A couple of cars are on the streets. She drops me off at the hospital doors like it's my first day of school. This is something I need to do alone because of COVID restrictions. I walk down several flights of stairs into the bowels of the hospital where the operating theatres lie. I undress and put on a gown and compression stockings and wait for the surgeon. Once he arrives, I sign the consent form, which reminds me of the chances of severe disability or stroke. There's a small chance of death. Best not to dwell so much in this heightened state. Then I'm informed that it's unknown if there's a bed for me. There's a chance the surgery won't go ahead. So now here is a new worry, but it distracts me from visions of waking up paralyzed. Then word comes through, there's a bed. The operation is going to happen. In a few hours, some of my brain and its alien matter will have been removed. I'm taken to a series of waiting rooms. I go to the toilet almost every five minutes. The nerves rush through my body like cold sweats. Finally, three hours after arriving at the hospital, I'm in the operating theater. It's cool in there. Tremors vibrate through my body. He's cold, someone says. Some gel packs are applied to my back and midriff. I don't have the guts to say, the shivers are because I'm bricking it. I focus on my breathing and wait for the surgeon to arrive. In time, I hear him walk in. The tension is horrible. If my eyes are closed, I can try and forget where I am, what I'm about to go through. Suddenly, there's a buzzing noise. It gets louder and louder till it's millimeters away from my head. It's the hair clippers. Half my head is shaved. Then a cannula is inserted into my hand. I fade into unconsciousness. About half an hour later, after my scalp has been peeled back and my skull drilled open, I'm woken up. My head is in a metal clamp. There are drapes separating me from the surgeon. I can't see him at all. The neuropsychologist says hello. It's bright. I'm a little disorientated, but sedated enough that I don't have a panic attack on the table. If I had the capacity to process what was happening, I might have done. One of the first things I say to the neuropsychologist is, do you like board games? I don't know why I say this. He does, and we discuss our favorites. He likes a bluffing game called Skull. I'm too out of it to comprehend or comment on the irony. Then come the exercises, endless activities that keep me busy and give data to the surgeon about what parts of my brain are doing what. First I count backwards from 40, then it's finger taps, 
them both together. For most of the two hours, I'm moving my left arm up and down, making fists and releasing them. Intraoperative brain mapping is a procedure that involves pressing directly down onto the brain with electrodes to identify critical areas in the brain that control sensory, motor or language function. This is so nothing essential is interfered with or removed during surgery. I tell them it's painful and some more anaesthetic is dispensed. I can feel it moving through the cannula into my hand. I close my eyes again and think of the sea. They caused a partial seizure at one point, so my eyes just started wobbling in my head. The neuropsychologist said, that's a seizure, and they all sort of noted it and acknowledged it. Um, and I don't think that part of the brain was touched again. Were you aware of that happening? Yeah, I was aware. Like, so it was, a, I think it was, yeah, they said partial seizure because I was aware of it, you know. Um, I felt very stuck. I could feel my eyes wobbling, and I thought, okay, this is this is bad. And then, But it didn't happen again. It didn't last very long. After more tests, counting and arm movements, I'm told it's done. Either I can be put back to sleep while they sew up my scalp and drill my skull back on, or stay awake. I opt for the former. When I wake up this time, it's bright. I'm disorientated again. I'm sitting half up on a bed in my own cubicle. Two nurses are by my side. And there's a plastic tube coming down from my head. It seems to have been sewn onto my scalp. My brain makes popping and sucking noises. I can feel fluid moving around in my head. Every few seconds, there's a painful whoosh as liquid is sucked into the tube and down to the plastic sack, a kind of satchel hanging over my shoulder. It has to be left in for 24 hours. It'd make a perfect Halloween outfit. Soon I'm wheeled into a ward where people are lying around like wounded soldiers with bandages wrapped around their heads. Some are just waking up. You can hear the wails of confusion. I adjust my bed and take out my phone. It's time to let people know I'm okay. A nurse comes to ask me my name. She asks me what the day is and if I know where I am. It's a test that's given to all the patients throughout the day. One poor man gets the questions wrong. Where are you? says the nurse. I don't know, he replies, starting to cry. He must be 60. Why are you crying? I don't know. The nurse soothes him. To all the questions, he replies that he doesn't know. I feel sad for him. But there's no judgment here. Wrong answers aren't reprimanded. Everyone just wants to be well. I can't wait for the drain to come out. It's so painful. Regular morphine is given to me. I throw up a few times before trying to get some sleep. Thing is, I have to sleep upright because the drain needs the help of gravity to catch all the fluid. The night is sleepless. People snore and I wish I could do the same. I'll be home tomorrow with this plastic tube out. I'm discharged and head back home. I'm so tired I can't reflect much on the experience. The surgeon said surgery wasn't curative, so going back is very likely. I can't think about that now. I just want some sustenance in my bed. I remember when you came back, you were quite lively. It felt like you were just sort of running on adrenaline almost because we were all quite shocked at how much energy you had. And then I think two days later, you just had this mad crash. Yeah, I mean, I think this the recovery time was pretty quick, all things considered. Um, I think I wanted to try and re return to normal, so I was wanting to go for walks and, you know, wanting to, you know, do those activities that I wasn't able to do in hospital. Uh, and then, yeah, I did have a couple of days where I just slept and slept. The week that follows is grim. Before I know it, five days have passed and I haven't been to the toilet. My bowels are comatose. One night my temple swells to the size of a ping pong ball and feels like it was split open at any minute, spilling out with veins. So I head back to the hospital to check there's no infection, which there isn't. My scalp staples come out. It's shocking to see what's been under the bandages. Thick metal train tracks holding my skin together. I'm a villain out of Mad Max. I'm supposed to have the biopsy results one week after surgery, but there's a problem. The result hasn't been received yet. The appointment is pushed back another week. 
I don't think there's much cause for concern. After all, a week seems like a short amount of time to send off a tissue sample, have it analysed and receive the result. So I continue resting, gradually building up my strength, going for slightly longer walks each day. In time, my bowels wake up again. Now, looking back on this time, I feel a perverse nostalgia, the nostalgia of ignorance. This is still the time when I'm innocent of the facts of what is to come. In my head, it's a simple time when I felt tired and wounded, but was not obsessed with mortality. Eventually, the surgeon's secretary rang me and confirmed the new appointment. The results were back. I never felt nervous. After all, it was a benign tumour, a low-grade glioma, right? Someone texted me saying, good luck for Friday, and I texted back saying, thanks, I'm looking forward to some closure. I'd not been led to expect anything else. Uh, and then, the, so the biopsy came back and, you know, they they said, oh, unfortunately, it's difficult news, you've got a, a, a high-grade glioma, or a high-grade tumour, grade 4 glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive and highly malignant um, form of brain cancer. So it was a massive shock. I'd been led to believe that it was a sort of non-malignant, fairly harmless tumour. They didn't explicitly say you have cancer, but it was, you know, they said you highly malignant tumour. Um, and I think and reflect, and when I reflected on it, I said, you know, the care I'd had was exceptional. They'd done everything well, but they hadn't managed my expectations very well at all. Um, so there was never even talked about as a possibility that it would be cancer or a high grade tumor and this this was all done via video call because of the pandemic so you, that that kind of news you don't really want to receive in your living room on a, talking into a screen you kind of want to have it in person where you can look at scans and have the kind of the kind of personal experience of being in the room with a nurse and a clinician what was your first reaction when you heard that news i didn't didn't have a I didn't it wasn't shock and I didn't have a kind of sinking feeling I still I was a little bit confused as to the vocabulary where I you know they were kind of saying malignant and I was thinking does that mean bad or does that just mean cancer um so I never it wasn't I I didn't immediately think I have cancer I have cancer I thought hmm I don't what does that mean and I, I didn't they just said you know that now you need to just focus on dealing with this news, dealing with this diagnosis, and we referred you to the oncology team. So, of course, you know, oncology, you think, okay, cancer treatment, et cetera. Uh, and they talked a little bit about the the treatment that I'd be having, so it'd be six weeks of radiotherapy and chemotherapy, um, starting a ASAP, really. So s gradually the news kind of sank in that it was a pretty serious diagnosis, Um and yeah, my life would be very different afterwards. And what was the kind of immediate future going to look like from from what they were saying? It was going to be you know six weeks of radiotherapy. It's going to be a tough couple of months ahead. Lots of appointments, lots of practical things like having a radiotherapy mask made. They said you know you're going to have a a. a a consultation with the oncologist next week and I thought okay that that's going to be my opportunity to find out about the diagnosis in a lot more detail maybe find out about prognosis um and my chances of beating it and, and that kind of thing so I had six weeks of radiotherapy alongside six weeks of chemotherapy going into hospital every weekday for six weeks which was quite intense you have a mask molded especially to my face um and they just clamp clamp it down very hard and then just give you this radiation blasted straight to the head. It was quite unpleasant. It's quite, quite synesthetic. It felt like my senses were being scrambled, like I could smell chemicals and I could sort of taste the kind of laser lights that were passing across. Uh, I couldn't really see much because my eyes were sort of clamped shut from the mask. Um, and then, yeah, I was very tired all the time, you know, towards the end, I felt like incredibly tired. Like I just couldn't really function properly and was like just going to sleep for like an hour or two every day. Um, and then, yeah, finished that a couple of weeks ago. What was the outcome that they were hoping for from radiotherapy? 
the radiotherapy and the chemotherapy is just to scoop up the kind of remaining little cancer cells, the microparticles, so they don't so it doesn't grow back so quickly. So yeah, kind of like you know you've weeded the garden and then you just need to go along and get those last little niggling bits out. Um, and then yeah, so then I've got six more months of chemotherapy once a month um, that will take us up to September. Uh, and that's, yeah, again, to do the same sort of thing, to just get rid of the kind of debris. Particularly with the radiotherapy, I was really noticing like, how much energy that you would have by, by like, the end of the weekend when you'd had a couple of days off. And then as the week went through again, I could really see it, like, wearing you down physically. Yeah. Like, kind of a, more mentally, how were you feeling about that process? Mentally, I felt a little bit anxious that the tiredness was just going to kind of persist and persist um, because it seemed so kind of long-standing at that point. Um, and then I think also there's a kind of a, an ongoing anxiety about the long-term effects of radiotherapy. So it ages your brain about 10 years, having radiotherapy to the brain. Um, and, you know, they said, oh, you'll probably lose your short-term memory. Um, and yeah, you're cognitively, you'll just be a bit different. And that those kind of um, effects will manifest sort of six months down the line. Um, so, yeah, there's certainly like an anxiety about my cognitive sharpness in the future. You know, will I be able to do this? Will I be able to do that? Um, follow the thread of a conversation, read a book, you know, concentrate for more than... 15 minutes at a time I don't know yeah it's it but they said everyone is completely different um and you know you just have to see how you get on down the line and uh, the the radiographer said something quite interesting to me she said you know we're we've all got two arms and two legs and that's where the similarity stops everyone is just complete inside everyone is completely different and they respond completely differently to the various treatments in his book, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer, Siddhartha Mukherjee quotes the poet Jason Shinder. Cancer, Shinder wrote, is a tremendous opportunity to have your face pressed right up against the glass of your mortality. Mukherjee adds to this, but what patients see through the glass is not a world outside cancer, but a world taken over by it, cancer reflected endlessly around them like a hall of mirrors. Many people don't want to be defined by their cancer, but in too many ways it's impossible to escape. I see it in everything. On TV the other day there was an old man with a thick grey beard. My mind immediately thought, oh, it's a shame I won't grow that old or have a grey beard like that one day. It colours everything. In my case, I will almost certainly succumb to this disease, whether it happens in 5, 10 or 20 years. Most with a glioblastoma die in 5 years, but a small number are spared longer. Not knowing how long you've got makes it hard to make plans. In the space of a few months, I've been prescribed a fear of death that I never had. At least, I thought I'd have a few more decades to learn how to live with it. Some people are murdered or hit by lorries. Occasionally I wonder if this is a better fate than the slow rot of panic as I go in and out of scanners for the rest of my life. It's easy to lose yourself to despair and bitterness. This seems like a mechanism of thanatophobia, or fear of death, to keep you in a shell of anxiety. As weeks of chemotherapy bled into months, I retreated into a shell, back into my head, cursing the world for giving me this. If life was only fatigue and anxiety, and it was all going to be over soon, how could I live again? There is no simple answer, and relearning how to live is something I need to do every day. Slowly, I'm reclaiming my future, transposing it to the present. Whatever I had planned to do has to happen today. I accept that. There are things I do not accept. That will come with time and a welcoming of vomit, fatigue and panic. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Dom. 
how did you feel when you first listened to it through after it was all put together? How did that make you feel? I think, um, firstly, there was a, a satisfaction and sense of, um, not closure, but kind of, uh, you know, we've been working on this intermittently for several months and now it's all done. And it was nice to hear all the separate elements, the music, the soundscape, the interview, my um, kind of text that I'd um, written and then recorded all come together in some kind of harmony. Uh, but equally, there was also um, quite intense hearing my story back. Yeah. It's the kind of the whole journey in a sense condensed into half an hour in a immersive and quite honest way Mm -hmm. Um, so just being with those memories being with that um reality that i live most days uh, either thinking back to the sort of strange uh, experience of having open brain surgery awake uh, or just that moment of getting the diagnosis so those memories are kind of ticking along and just to have it in a recorded thing was to listen to that back. It's like, well, I'm reliving this memory, but in a different form, in an external form. Yeah. So did that kind of increase your sense of reflection about it? It did. It did. It definitely did, especially with the ending. Um, the original ending was incredibly bleak mm-hmm. and almost self-indulgently pessimistic almost as if I was trying to prove something about my viewpoint of the world or trying to show listeners how unpleasant um, my journey's been but then I thought no one really wants to listen to a very sad cynical story well, it's, not, it's not cynical but the, the original ending was quite cynical so that was one thing that we changed. Did that surprise you that that changed? Not especially. I think one one of the positive things about changing the ending was it made me look harder and reflect more deeply about what was really positive about the experience and, you know, what I'd learned. And it kind of, yeah, it made me look around, reevaluate and think, I right, no, it, things aren't all doom and gloom. There is some really important lessons that I've learned here. And um, I've learned about myself. And yeah, so it was kind of reaffirming. And I thought taking those kind of shards of of hope and emphasizing them more, that's the best way to end the story. Mm -hmm. I think the process of storytelling, especially your own story, your own experience, that description that you gave of being able to almost dive into the next layer of how you really feel whether that be kind of a reflection of, oh my God, look how much I've done, or whether that be a kind of, okay, how do I really feel about the ending? Did you feel like it gave you a chance to dive into your thoughts in a way that maybe other mediums wouldn't have? Yeah, I think so. That's that's, um, a really interesting point. Because the text or what I say at the end of the essay was written and honed and crafted. It meant much more thought was put into the content of those sentences, Mm -hmm. which in turn made me think more deeply, um, more kind of vigorously about what I really wanted to say and what I really had discovered in going through this process. Yeah. And what I love, I mean, there's so many things that I love about it is you've really captured not just the big moments, but I think something that's left out of a lot of stories about cancer, which is the middle spaces, that moment when you wake up in the morning and like you come into the day and like you said, that 10 minutes staring at the wall and the drug users in the other bed in the hospital wanting money for more drugs and these things that I think aren't really talked about but a really big part of people's everyday experience with it. Was that something intentional for you to include the smaller moments? Um, I think those things developed in the story quite organically. Mm-hmm. Um, they, for me, are, are a representation of the way that cancer 
imbues or spreads into every area of our lives or or my everyday life. So through the kind of banal interactions I had with other people or something as basic and boring as waking up that most people just, they wake up and they might have a thought about what they're going to cook for dinner. Right. When you've got cancer or this kind of big heaviness weighing over you, it's like, well, that's has much more of a force in your life or in my life at least. Have you sent this out to your friends, to your family? Um, what have been the responses to this so far? Yeah, I've sent it out to a few friends and family. And so far, the responses have been really positive and encouraging. I think especially helpful for me is sending it to people who I haven't seen for a while. It's a much better way, I think, to send them this and say, look, here's a immersive sonic experience I've created with my friend that kind of details my cancer journey. Um, and I think you probably get more out of this listening alone or whatever. And then we can talk about it afterwards than me just blabbering on and incoherently trying to get my story across. I think because this is something that's been created, edited, refined, um, it doesn't have any of the fat or waffling that is added into kind of conversation. I know you said that the responses have been positive. Have there been any particular expressions that have come up that people have messaged you with afterwards or how, um, how they felt listening to it? I think there has been um, some gratitude from people um, for, for being honest and being uh, vulnerable, I suppose, mm-hmm. and kind of talking about those difficult things when maybe we would, we would prefer to just push those to the side. You know, the statistics are quite depressing, but to, to weave those gloomier details in with the kind of mundane and also the the personal Mm -hmm. I think there's yeah it's a kind of nice mix of expression in there and the funny I mean the better out than in um part like had (laughs) me cracking up (laughs) yeah so I think that the idea to include that conversation Mm -hmm. um, I just I think added a bit more of a sort of natural, organic quality to the otherwise quite structured. And Mm -hmm. it's a thing of artifice, I suppose. You know, I didn't I didn't catch it fully the first time I listened. But when you were talking about board games with a neurosurgeon. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And he said his favorite game was Skull. And you're like, I didn't really take that on board at the time. I'm like, oh, wow. Those- yeah, I don't know why I I, um, I asked that question. I mean, he, yeah, that kind of whole experience of the brain surgery, I do remember it, parts of it vividly. I mean, I he was called Dr. Node. And I think I remember saying, oh, isn't it like, do, do, you, do people comment on the fact that you're a doctor and you're a Dr. Node because of Node being a medical mm-hmm. Um, thing and I think he was just like oh, let's hurry this surgery up and get this going <laughs> <laughs> or something like that I don't know I don't know how much I trust my my memory right um but I think one of the really important things for me in terms of the process of putting this together was being able to spend time with these memories and kind of excavating parts of myself being with them um in that way almost made Um, me fear the illness less or Mm. fear the weight of the journey less a little bit like I had some um, some EMDR and I think the principle of EMDR is you have these strong memories that you're struggling to kind of put into your long-term memory or struggling to forget that you just keep reliving them and I think in a way this was quite a healing process for me to, to to spend time with these memories and you know feel their shape and their content their texture and so on and see that they are they're just memories that haunt me from time to time but they're ultimately they're fine and you know learning to be fine with those things that was that was a great thing about doing this and I think um I would encourage anyone who is interested in writing or creating or storytelling or whatever is, is exploring those difficult things those difficult memories and it it can be very therapeutic yeah and emdr is that the eye movement one yes i mean i think it's one of these things that lots of people know about and aware of but Mm -hmm. 
you, I think we're both in a similar position where we kind of understand the principles of it, but like to a certain extent. So if I were to try and um, explain how it works, I'm sure I would butcher it completely. But I think as I understand it, it is, yeah, it is the thing with the eye movements, but you can also do it, um, it with like hand movements as well. And I think I did it over zoom, which wasn't great. Um, and I, I also didn't think it was that helpful for me because okay. I wasn't um, I wasn't having any sort of PTSD from these um, the experiences I had or these memories. They weren't um, bothering me so much. You know, my friend had something very violent happen to him um, and he found EMDR enormously helpful, whereas me, it was kind of like just the sort of... Um, morose reflections of having an incurable form of cancer. Yeah. I think that's the thing with shine in particular, like that everyone's so unique in how we process, how we, you know, what we need. And it's so lovely to hear about other people's experiences with storytelling or, you know, writing poetry or some people turn their experiences into a comedy show. Like, some people love EMDR and some people it just, yeah, it's not for them. And I think it's really important to know that there are things out there that can be useful, but it's never going to work on everybody. So if someone else wanted to tell their story, where would you tell them to begin? I think finding the form they're most comfortable with first is is really key. So whether it's poetry or it's fiction or something like radio or podcast or film could be drawing um, and see if that's compatible with the story they want to tell. Um, so this audio essay just felt like the natural form for this specific story I wanted to tell. It could have been done as a sort of just a text based journalistic kind of essay that you would get in some uh, magazine if that's not being too <laughs> <laughs> Grandiose, but yeah, something like that. I mean, it could it could have been a poem or it could have been a short story, but I felt like I wanted to have that blending of different audio styles or mm-hmm. audio forms. So I wanted to have the conversation and I wanted to have the soundscape um, and music to kind of really immerse the listener in and, and get that kind of sense of atmosphere and mood. Um, and then to lay my narration over the top, it all kind of came together in a in a way that felt like the perfect form for this story because i think the the sounds that i heard or you know still hear to this day they really stay with me um the, you know the dripping um of the drain uh, and when they attach this drain thing i think i mentioned it in the essay yeah you know i'll never forget that it was just this kind of quite horrible sucking sensation and and from the radiotherapy i still have these kind of weird noises like clicking and popping and kind of in, they affect my sleep or especially when I'm lying down it's just it feels like I don't know someone's just in my head kind of with some sort of toys just or like a plunger um so I think you know the 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 importance of sound in my journey and my story felt like it needed to make its way into this as a sonic story and I think it really does that like you feel very placed by the yeah. sound and, you know, imagining that inside your head. And it was really interesting to hear about that that synesthesia that you were saying. It was like during the, the radiation, like you could hear certain sounds. Mm. And I, I, so I, I also just to add about advice for anyone who wants to tell their story, I think just getting ideas down, even if you have something really ambitious that feels quite unachievable, just get the get it in the pot, you know, get some ideas simmering, whether it's phrases or sentences or metaphors or whatever. Get it in the pot, start, you know, get that simmering going. And eventually a time will come when you when you're ready to start forging the story. And I think that's a really special moment. Yeah. When you things when you bring all these things together. I also think it brings kind of an awareness into your day because You know, if something, you know, either particularly mundane or funny or weird happens and you have like a little notebook or you have kind of some mental space to put that away, 
it can give you a place to put things that maybe if you were just shoving them in the back of the wardrobe of your brain, just trying to get through, just trying to get through. Like sometimes we don't realize what we're carrying with us. So I think that charting them down sounds really good, like whether or not they end up in a story. Yeah. Tell me about what it's like, because I know you have a lot of creative projects on the go. What is it like doing them and navigating the tiredness and all the physical effects and mental effects that you're having to deal with? Yeah, it's pretty difficult. I think some days you just have to realize or acknowledge that it's not going to be a particularly creative day, even if I'd planned to spend two hours writing my novel or doing this or that. And if I've slept poorly or I'm really tired, then those will have to be kind of delayed, postponed. Um, so yeah, just kind of giving myself permission to have a day off if, if things are too, too difficult mm-hmm. um, physically or emotionally. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, in terms of dealing with fatigue outside of the creativity, I'm just being outside is really important to me, listening to birds, being in nature. And also being, I think being outside and walking, especially as well, a lot of ideas seem to um, come it's almost like um, floating in the air. And you can kind of just, if you've got your net, I think it was Noel Gallagher or Philip Larkin, or one, they've talked about ideas coming and you've got to catch them. So I think being outside is really, is really good for me in terms of helping with fatigue, but also having the advantage of improving creativity. Um, Have you read Big Magic, Elizabeth Gilbert's book? She sort of talks about that, that the catching of ideas. Is she the one who wrote um, Eat, Pray, Love? Yeah. I've seen her TED talk. Yeah. So the idea that you don't have to think up your creativity, that you're more of a channel and it moves through you and out, which she found to be like kind of released her from a lot of the pressure. Mm. But she mm. tells a story that she was writing this book and it was about this woman. She was in love with her boss and the boss had a son that went to South America and got involved in like a drugs deal gone bad or something and like disappeared. And she had to go from middle America to South America. And while she was writing it, she got distracted by other things going on in her life and she met this um, other writer and they were writing back and forth and then one day she was like oh you know tell me what is it that you're working on and um, the other woman said well I'm writing a book about this woman she's in love with her boss her boss has has this son who's gone to South America but he's disappeared so she travels to South America to find (laughs) and like Elizabeth Gilbert was like I think my story when I when I got distracted jumped and went to somebody else because hmm. <laughs> um, she was like that's not a genre that's not like I'm doing a, a horror it was like loads of specifics so she had this idea yeah it was kind of similar to that that we we catch ideas and so putting ourselves in like kind of a good place to do that so it sounds like outside is a good place for you definitely. So what's it been like for you to be involved with Shine? Being involved with Shine has been great. Um, It's just been wonderful to be part of a community of people who really know what it's like to be going through cancer. And yeah, it's I think when, when I hang out with my friends, none of whom have cancer, people will say, oh, you know, like it must be so difficult or, um, whatever trying trying to kind of empathize and no one really gets it it's it's not an experience you can kind of adequately imagine i think you know having that fatigue and that fear of well just <laughs> so many different types of fear yeah well one word i learned since being diagnosed was thanatophobia it's death fear essentially um you know that that is something that kind of sits with me quite strongly um, and pete and i guess like that also comes into my conversations from time to time because I'm quite interested in questions about mortality and so on. But with the guys at Shine, that is kind of ticking a, ticking along in the background, this this fear or, or acknowledgement that mortality is very present within us. Um, mm. It's 
I was going to say much more alive within us, but that's obviously a poor way of expressing it. But um, so, yeah, and I'm, I've been, I've raised some money for Shine through selling art, not my own, but um, my friend, Yvonne Coomba, who very generously donated some prints. So I sold those. And then I've also been um, a regular attendee of the film club hosted by the wonderful Claire Dawson. Yeah. She's um, been on the podcast Again, several times. She is wonderful. Yes. In fact, um, I was listening to the episode the other day about fatigue and she phoned in and yeah, it was just wonderful to kind of hear her story because of when we're talking about films, we're not talking about our cancer as much, but it's, yeah, so it's nice to just kind of hear that side of her story. China has been a wonderful, wonderful place for me. And then um, I look forward to some more fun times with everyone at Shine. Excellent. I, I'm not sure I can say that word. Is it thanatophobia? Yes, like from Thanatos, the uh, Greek mythology, mythological figure. It's nice to have a space where other people understand that and, and that's there. But also, like by describing the film club, there's also so many other things to do that that can kind of go into the background and you can just share a passion with other people who who understand um, I've heard that you've sent in some ranty emails about certain films. Yes, I, I'm afraid I have. Um, I haven't been able to make it to the last few sessions, but yeah, there was a film the other day that they did that I watched. I, I just absolutely despised, and I thought, well, I need, <laughs> I need to just get this out and get on my soapbox, um, give it a solid no stars out of ten. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, so Should I we said, ask uh, what film it was? It was um, I Care A Lot, I think. Oh, I don't know that the one. Rosamund Pike. It's just, yeah, I mean, I can I can send you the email if you like. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Dom. And if someone is like like me, actually, listening to your piece and is like, I want to hear more, like I want to hear more of your stories or more of your projects like where would they go to see what you're up to and what what you've done um well i'd be happy for anyone interested in my stories to they could email me um, yeah. or they could check out the website it's uh, www.purpleear.co.uk so it's purple ear so with both e's that's where you can hear more what we call sonic stories so it's my narrated strange tales combined with um caleb's soundscapes and music and um yeah there's information about the film that we made on there this is animation um or yeah or just or just email me and i'm happy to include the email as well you are a powerhouse of creativity <laughs> like in the novel um filmmaking storytelling your own personal narrative um yeah it's it's uh it's really wonderful and thank you so much for you know sharing that with us thank you for inviting me on it's uh, it's a pleasure to to talk through yeah and maybe and maybe you'll come back another time i hope so i hope so yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dominic. And thank you to all of you for listening. If you'd like to hit like, subscribe, it really does help other people find us. And so till next time, bye. Bye.